Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar today. If you're unable to hear or see the presentation at any point, please raise a hand using the webinar toolbar and a colleague will investigate you for you straight away. Okay, so let me start with a few introductions. I'm Lisa Conway and I'm one of the account managers here at the Coal Authority. I'm also delighted to, today to be joined by Daniela Rosa, the strategic account manager from Groundshore. So thanks for joining us today, Danielle, and a very warm welcome from us here at the Coal Authority. Thank you, good morning. Good morning. So today's webinar is centered around our new Enviro in One report that's a joint product with our partners at Groundshore. Our main goal during today's webinar will be to review the new Enviro in One report, looking at the changes that we've made, and then we'll run through each of the different sections in detail. So please feel free to ask any questions throughout the webinar or equally at the end, and we'll look to respond to everyone by using a um, handy FAQ document capturing any of the questions that you raised today. I'll also supply my contact details at the end of the webinar to enable you to contact me directly should you wish to do so with any additional questions or requests. Um, and finally, there will be a short survey at the end um, and we're always looking to improve our presentations. So we really, really would appreciate you taking a few seconds to answer any questions and supplies with your feedback. Okay, so let's run through the learning objectives for today's session. We're going to start by covering off what mining legacy looks like by using some facts and figures. Danielle will then move on to the risks associated with environmental factors. And then we will spend some time uh, running through how our information is managed from the coal authority and ground shore side of things. Um, we'll then explain the different sections of the new Enviro Wall in one report and, and run through what they actually mean. Uh, and then we'll finally wrap today's session up by explaining what support is available from our teams here at the Coal Authority and from Groundshore. So let's kick things off um, and look at some of the high level numbers behind mining legacy. So as you can see here on screen, around 11% of the UK is occupied by the coal field, and that's illustrated on the map, on the map there to the right. Um, and this equates to around 172,000 recorded mine entries on the UK coal field that we know of. But this may only be around one third of the total mine entries throughout the UK. And this is before the 1872 Act, there was no legal requirement to submit abandonment plans. And therefore, before that date, we simply have no record of where those mine entries are. So for a bit of background, our database of mining information is established from upwards of 360,000 mine abandonment plans that we hold here at the Coal Authority. However, unrecorded mine entries are being found all of the time, and I'll explain how new information is added into our database um, later on in the presentation. So let's hang fire on that point for now. So in terms of the UK as a whole, this then equates to around 7 million properties that sit within the coal field, and 130,000 of those properties lie within 20 metres of at least one mine entry. So as you can see by the numbers, mining legacy is still something um, millions of people need to be aware of. So the impacts of all of this means that our public safety and substance team handle upwards of 600 surface hazards and 500 substance claims each and every year as part of our statutory obligations, um, all of which have an impact on some form on the public. So alongside all of that, and again under our statutory obligations, we're also dealing with upwards of 7,500 planning applications each year, and this is to ensure that mining legacy remains at the forefront of people's minds and that the correct investigations and considerations are being taken. So Danielle is now going to run through um, the environmental aspects of the roof of the report. Great, thank you. Um, so as you can see on the screen, there is a whole bunch of different stats. Um, you know, from an environmental perspective, we not only take into account things like contaminated land, but we look at things like flood risk. We look at natural ground substance and radon. Um, the Environment Agency 
estimate that around 300,000 hectares of land in England and Wales is affected to some extent by industrial contamination. However, the research we've actually undertaken here at Groundshore using our unique historic mapping data, which I will talk a little bit about later, has revealed that around 619,000 hectares was formerly covered by a wide range of industrial sites. So that's actually more than double the EA's figures. And you know, we'll talk about historical mapping and why that's really important. Yet a very small percentage has been officially designated as contaminated land. So 0.007% uh, is officially designated as contaminated land. Um, you've got over 22,000 historic landfill sites throughout the country. Um, and some of the you know, more common risks that are associated with things like historic landfill sites would be uh, things like leachate and uh, methane gas migration, which can, can end up in explosions and whatnot. Um, you've got one in six properties which are at risk of flooding, and we're, we'll talk about flooding in a bit more detail, but you're looking at not just river and coastal flooding, but also things like surface and groundwater flooding. And there's over na 35,000 natural uh, ground subsidence claims each year in the to the insurance industry, which is quite a lot of money, you know, approximately 300 million, um, give or take, depending on the type of year it has been. So it could be, if it's an extremely wet or ex extremely dry year, then that can also have an effect on subsidence claims. And we've got issues like radon, which is the second biggest cause of lung cancer after smoking, which is more prevalent in certain parts of the country, which we will look at in a bit further detail going forward. Thanks, Danny. So before we dive into the detail, we thought it would be good to establish the foundations of our reports. And that will start with the data and the information that we use to assess risk. Okay, so let's start with how our database was built in the first place. So all of the information we use for our investigations, our reports, or anything else offered here at the Coal Authority comes from the information we hold within our industry-leading database of mining information. The foundations of the database are built on all of the mine abandonment plans that have been deposited by mine operators over the year following uh, the closure of the mines. So we currently hold um, a large proportion of these in our archives um, here in Mansfield. And at present, there are just over 360,000 separate abandonment plans dating right back to the 1800s. So the thing to bear in mind is that the legislation which made it mandatory for operators to deposit an abandonment plan upon the closure of the mine was only introduced in 1872, and this was by the Coal Mines Regulation Act and the Metalliferous Mines Regulation Act. Um, and these pieces of leg legislation made it a legal requirement for these abandonment plans to be deposited within three months of a mine being closed down. So again, before the 1872 Act, there was no legal requirement. To help give some background and reasoning uh, to the introduction of these 1872 Acts, these were introduced following the loss of life at a coal mine in County Durham in the 1836. Um, and this was a result of flooding from old coal mine workings. So this incident then prompt, prompted the first mines record office to be established um, by government at the time, and this was for the voluntary registration and preservation of any abandonment plans. However, despite the tragic accident I've mentioned, uh, the majority of companies didn't really buy into this idea, and as such, they just didn't deposit any plans. So a few years later, um, and moving to the 1850s, an Act of Parliament was passed to make it a requirement for coal mines throughout the UK to be inspected. And this Act also made it a requirement for mine owners uh, to keep a plan at each mine. So that hopefully provides some background uh, into the information side of things. Alongside all of that, our public safety and substance team play a vital part in our business here. Um, we have mining engineers and mining surveyors out on site day in, day out, and these are monitoring any mine shafts which long, run alongside the full mine inspection program we have uh, to ensure the mine shafts or addicts remain safe and poses no risk to the public. Uh, these teams then report back to our mining information managers here, um, and any site investigations or any remediation works that have been carried out to that particular property or area um, is then loaded into our geographic information system, so our GIS, which then feeds through to our reports 
or within 24 hours of receiving that update. So um, in terms of things like SLAs uh, for all, all of our mining uh, residential reports, we're proud to be able to deliver the reports in a matter of minutes. Um, the Envirowall in one, we've added some di additional details. So um, in the footer of every page, you'll see some contact details. And this is really for ease um, and a, a useful contact point. So if you ever do need any additional um, help or support, you can easily uh, get those details. Um, on top of all of that, we also have a full team of specialists waiting to take your call. So um, if you ever need any support or you want to chat a case through with us, please do feel free to give us a call at any time and we'll be more than happy to help you. So I'm now going to pass back over to Danny, who's going to run through the Groundshore side of things. Thanks, Lisa. So from Groundshore's perspective, you know, we maintain a large data set um, that is proprietary to us, but we also work with over 100 data providers, um, you know, gathering all this data. And it, it's a big task looking after all these data points. And it's very key to keep all of this as up to, up to date and accurate as possible, because this is what we make um, our assessments on. So we have a dedicated GIS team whose sole responsibility is to look after all that data that we get from suppliers as well as our own. And, and if, as you can imagine, with the hundreds of different suppliers that we work with, we get data updates constantly. We're looking in some cases from yearly, quarterly, monthly, all the way down to daily, which is how often we update our planning data to give you a, a more specific example. Now, the solid foundations of the Enviro All-in-One from an Enviro perspective really begins with the mapping side of things. So Grantor have a unique data set called the Historic Land Use Database, or the HLUD for short, which is the main data set we use for contaminated land risk assessments. So we digitized over 1.3 million ordnance survey maps dating all the way back to the 1840s at the highest resolution available which means our maps are very clear and easy to read, which is quite important when you're an environmental consultant doing a risk assessment. Now, this HLUD is what, what underpins the reports as we use a risk algorithm to help assess the risk and it then interrogates the HLUD to provide the best results we possibly can when it comes to environmental risk. Now, the HLUD, to give you kind of a bit of context and an example is if you think of a disused railway station with all its depots and warehouses and fuel tanks and office blocks, et cetera, et cetera. Now, others would have highlighted the whole area as a disused railway station, drawn a big polygon around it and potentially blighted it. What we've actually done is a little bit different is we've broken sites and maps down into individual features. So we've drawn a polygon around every single risk feature on that site, which means we've drawn a polygon around the depots, the warehouse, the fuel tanks, the office blocks, the railway sidings. We've then categorized them by their specific land use, and then we've risk ranked them, which is why our data set has over 27,000 individual land use classes alone. So we don't generalize everything. We make it as specific as possible, which means that our data set for contaminated land is much more granular and much more property specific, um, which allows us to be able to provide uh, risk assessments, which are much more relevant uh, to contaminated land moving forward. So that's kind of one of the biggest features we have when it comes to um, data sets, but it is an absolute mammoth of a task looking after all of these, you know, all of these data sets. And we work very hard to keep them updated every day. Thanks, Danny. No um, so what we're going to do now is talk you through the new Envirowall in one report, um, and then we're going to run through each of the different sections. So visually, one of the brand new features of the report is the dashboard on the front cover, and this allows you to quickly see your focus areas for the subjects highlighted. The Envirowall in one is a fully integrated official coal and environmental search, and all of the questions responded to in the official CON 29M are formulated by liaison with the Law Society to ensure they provide all of the information sought after by the legal community when handling property transactions. Then based on the information and risk extracts, uh, the report gives an indication of further recommended reports to ensure that the purchaser has all of the key information available to them. So within the Envirowall in One report, you will receive information on past, present and future coal mining, coal entries, 
uh, coal mining geology, past, present and future open cast mining, coal mining subsidence, mine gas and hazards relating to coal mining. And then from an environmental perspective, you will also receive information on other ground stability, contaminated land, flood risk, radon, and then the report will also provide three screens. So you've got your energy, your transportation, and your planning. To mention as well, the residential EnviroWalling one also comes teamed up with an insurance policy provided by Liberty Legal Indemnities. So moving on now to the risk rating side of things, um, we've introduced a new traffic light system. Um, so the outputs are going to be either red, amber, or like a teal rating, um, and they will highlight any risk you need to be aware of. So taking a look at this, the coal mining section for a moment, um, this will flag three different responses. So there'll be identified, non-identified, or further action. So if an identified flag has come up, this is purely for information and not something you need to necessarily do anything with. If a non-identified flag has come up, there's nothing at all to do um, and this is a completely clear report. Finally, if there's something that appears in red, so that's your further action flag, um, this means that we found something and I'll explain more around this finding on the overview of findings and recommendations page, um, which again is in the new addition to the report. So we'll park that one for now. Danielle's now going to run through uh, the risk ratings from the environmental side of things. Uh, so over to you, Danny. Great. Um, so from the environmental side of things, we also use the traffic light uh, colors, just like the ones you see on the screen. It's a little bit different for us in a sense that, um, so for things like other ground stability, contaminated land and radon, you'll get a pass. Um, which of course is nice and green. Uh, you will get action required in red, which is applicable to contaminated land. Um, you will get a rating of identified, which is applicable to other ground stability radon in the three screenings, so energy, transportation, and planning. And this identified isn't necessarily a bad thing. It just means that there is information in there that has been identified that you may want to take into consideration. Um, flood has a slightly different rating because there's several. So there's, there's actually low or negligible, low to moderate, moderate, moderate to high and high. So this gives you a, a bit more granular of um, of a risk rating because there is a lot more nuance and, and different types of uh, flood risks, which we have to take into account, but they will all be um, broken down into its individual risk and you will get a specific rating for each of those flood risks uh, inside with an overall rating on the front. And that's it for me. Thank you. Um, so. As I mentioned earlier, another new addition to the report is the overview of findings and recommendations pages. So these can be found on page two. Um, these have been clearly designed with one goal in mind, to provide clients with a quick overview of the risks highlighted and then to advise of the next steps. So if we look at the coal mining uh, example, if a mine shaft is recorded within 20 meters of the property boundary, we would recommend an interpretive report so you can gather more information on that particular mine shaft. Um, and then from an environmental perspective, um, Danny, if you just want to cover that off. So from an environmental perspective, again, we, we take similar methodo uh, methodology. So if we found, as an example, if we found a contaminated land risk on the second page, we would provide uh, information on who you would need to contact and what questions to ask them in order to try and amend uh, the report to a pass. Um, if we find, another example would be if we found, um, let's say, groundwater flood risk to be a factor, we would provide adv advice on steps you would need to take to try and uh, prevent groundwater flooding and again the the correct organizations you need to perhaps speak to uh, and practical advice in terms of insurance if we've found any types of flood risk. Okay so now we've we've covered off a few of the changes what I'm going to do now is run through each section of the uh, coal authority information. So the first area that's covered is any underground coal extraction. So for past underground mining, the information that's supplied will include the number of the seams mined, the depth at which the, the coal was mined, the last time it was worked, and whether any related ground movement should have now stopped. 
For present underground mining, it will include the names of any seams being mined and information of any licenses that have been granted or those that are still being determined. And by licenses, we mean any permissions currently being given or reviewed for the coal to be mined. For any future underground mining, it will include the number of seams to be mined, uh, the depth of those seams and any planned dates for them being mined, and then any information surrounding any remaining coal reserves. Um, we will also supply information around our statutory notices of, of mining issues to the property owners, um, informing them that mining is due to take place beneath their property. And finally, um, and where we suspect that due to the geology in the area, any unrecorded workings that could exist. So for the mine entries, uh, the information supplied will include confirmation of any mine shafts or adits recorded within 20 metres of the property or land boundary. And if the information is available, uh, we will also provide details of any treatment and or conveyance details for the highlighted shafts or adits. So to explain uh, the differences between a shaft and an adit, a shaft is a vertical entry to the mine, whereas an adit is more of a tunnel-like entrance running horizontally or diagonally into the mine. Um, they both essentially do the same thing, but they simply allow the coal seam to be accessed in a slightly different way. Um, they tend to depend on the layout of, of the area. So for example, in South Wales, where the hills and, and, the, and there's mountains, adits are a bit more dominant down there. So when supplying information for coal mining related geology, the report will provide details of any lines of geological weakness that have affected the properties in the area as a result of coal mining related activity. When looking at the open cast mining, otherwise known as surface mining, which reflects the method of extraction, this is where coal is removed by using an open pit or burrow similar to a quarry. So for past, present and proposed future open cast mining, the information supplied will include if the property is within an open cast boundary of which coal has been extracted in the past, um, confirmation of whether there is a current open cast site within 200 metres of the boundary, and also details of the coal authority and whether they're considering granting an open cast licence for coal to be extracted within 800 metres of the boundary. Finally, um, and where there's been a license granted for coal to be extracted by open cast mining, um, this will be supplied within 800 metres of the boundary in the future. So moving now to coal mining related subsidence, um, this is where we provide details relating to our statutory obligations here at the Coal Authority. So when it comes to providing information surrounding subsidence, the report will um, include the date of any coal mining related substance claims made and whether or not those claims were accepted, rejected, withdrawn, or whether they're still actually being determined. And it will also cover off whether there's like a live stop notice. And to explain a stop notice, this is basically where we expect there to be further movement uh, within 800 metres of receiving a claim. Um, and as such, we would postpone any repairs relating to the substance under our statutory obligations. And this is until the ground movement has stopped. So finally, it would also include whether, and if so, how many claims have been made within a 50 metre radius of the boundary supplied. So moving on now to mine gas, it's important to mention that the mine gas is very rare these days. Um, here at the Coal Authority, we have upwards of around 700 mine gas monitoring sites throughout the UK, uh, where our experts monitor mine gas regularly to ensure there's no risk to the public and that the emission is carefully monitored. So then following on from that, we would always report on the mine gas to help give peace of mind. So within the report, we'll provide details of um, instances of where the Coal Authority have carried out mitigation works to manage the effects of the, coal, uh, the mine gas emission. Um, and there are four types of mine, mine gases that we report on. So you've got your, your methane, your carbon dioxide, your carbon monoxide, and your hydrogen sulfide. When we talk about hazards relating to coal mining, this could include various different things. So the idea of this section is to highlight any work carried out where a coal mining related hazard um, has been flagged. So these hazards are cases where um, they've been flagged and they've been managed by our public safety team and work has then been carried out under our statutory obligations. 
So I'm now going to hand back over to Danny, who's going to run through the environmental aspects of the report. Thanks, Danny. No worries. Thank you. So in terms of other ground stability, the Enviro All-in-One also covers other types of ground stability risks outside of coal. We split it into two categories, which is natural and non-natural ground stability risks. And the images that you see on the screen are just some examples where natural ground subsidence has occurred. Now, natural ground stability relates to natural ground subsidence and cavities and is defined as the upward, lateral, or downward movement of the ground, which can ultimately cause structural issues to properties. Um, the first two images on the slide that you can see demonstrate two types of subsidence, um, dissolution, which is basically where, where uh, soluble rock can be dissolved and the other is of course a landslide. Now the, the six main causes of natural ground subsidence according to the BGS are shrink swell. So these are common in areas where there could be potentially a lot of clay because the ground expands and contracts depending on how much moisture or water is in the ground and it can and of course make the ground move and anything built on top of that also move. You've got dissolution which I mentioned earlier. Um, this can happen in areas where there's a lot of soluble rock like chalk and when water flows through that rock it washes away layers of support and subsequently results in things like sinkholes. You've also got compressible and collapsible grounds which tends to happen again in areas with soft ground like peat um, and something called running sand where usually there is some sort of water source like a leaking pipe which washes away sandy layers and support which can again cause collapse and land, landslides I think are pretty self-explanatory as you see on the screen. Now the natural ground stability is rated in a scale of A to E, with E being the high, highest risk. And we then identify the possibility for not natural ground stability issues to occur through th things like infilled cavities or non-coal mining. So we do mine for other minerals like tin, brine, or clay, clay to name a few, and you know any other cavities caused by such mining activity. If we've identified any ground stability risks, we will provide all the maps, explanations, detail and advice required in the specific section for you and your client to read and provide uh, the most practical advice possible. Now, moving on to uh, contaminated land. So the Enviro All-in-One will assess the risk of contamination from a comprehensive set of data sources, um, which we split into three main categories. So we look at uh, past land use, we look at waste and landfills sites, and we look at current industrial use. So the past land use will review historic ordnance survey mapping, which I've mentioned previously in our HLUD. And our, our system will use a risk algorithm and our technology to assess contaminated land risk as per Part 2A of the Environmental Protection Act. We then look at waste and landfill and, and take agency and local authority data plus our own data and historic land use data to identify the presence of any landfill or wa waste sites or refuse areas. We also look at current industrial um, information and we review the data on permits, authorizations, spillages and incidents to give a view on the possible risk for contamination to be present. And each section is given a rating of either identified or passed in the environmental summary inside the report. Now if we've identified a contaminated land risk, uh, the report gets passed on to our environmental consultants who will do a detailed manual assessment of the risk, analyzing all of the data that we have as well as any additional data that we might have on file. So things Things like planning discharges or NHPC certificates or letters from the council which are still in date which we have had sent to us from um, other sources. Now once we've done an assessment and written the recommended advice then the consultant will pass it on to another consultant to do a peer review before it gets sent off and we try as much as possible to pass reports for contaminated land before it gets sent out. But just because a report comes back with uh, further action required or we've identified a potential risk that doesn't actually mean the land is contaminated it just means that we might need your help in obtaining additional information. Now let's have a look at some flood risk. So the Environment Agency published some figures or the, the latest figures we have on flood risk and the, the you know the properties at risk of flooding total 5.9 million homes. And these figures show that 3.2 million properties are at risk from surface water flooding and a, a further 2.4 million are at risk from river and coastal flooding. 
in the major floods of the winter 2015-2016, the total costs to the UK economy were over five billion pounds. And flooding is a growing risk for British property. Aside from the physical damage caused by floods, if a property is at risk of flooding, it may be very difficult to obtain a mortgage um, or obtain suitable insurance cover or potentially even make it very difficult for your client to sell a property because this can impact the overall value of the property. Um, there is a Law Society practice note which aims to provide you with information to help your clients investigate the terms on which buildings insurance cover, including flood risk, is available prior to entering into any contractual commitments. And we would hope that you would encourage your clients to make sure insurance can be obtained for the property on acceptable terms before actually going into that contract. As always, um, you know, you do have the seller's information form, which is the TA6, and it asks the question of the seller, has any part of the property, whether buildings or... with a simple yes or no answer, which does not contain enough detail to satisfy the practice note properly. So as always, caveat emptor or buyer beware should be employed here and further investigations undertaken in every transaction. And particularly with flood, it's important to make sure we're painting as complete of a picture possible using flood data from dependable and different sources. So the flood section in this report will cover river and coastal flood risk, surface and groundwater flood risk, and will take into account historic flood events as well as current or proposed flood defenses, as well as give a property specific statement on whether or not the property will be seeded into the flood reinsurance program. Now let's move on to radon. So we will then address the possibility as to whether or not radon is present within the property. Radon is a colorless, odorless radioactive gas formed by the radioactive decay of the small amounts of uranium that occur naturally in all rock and soils. As you can see on the map, it's prevalent in certain parts of the country due to the geology of the rock and therefore will be more common in some areas. It's the second biggest cause of lung cancer in the UK and prolonged exposure can lead to health issues. Property values could also be affected if it has not been dealt with. And the data that we use to identify radon um, is a mixture from the radon atlas as well as data from the HSC. And if a risk is identified, then the property specific measure should be taken uh, through, through the use of radon detectors, which are placed in the property for three months to identify actual radon readings. So it can be a long process to figure out whether or not, you know, the, prop the property is really at risk of radon um, if you want to get testing done. But if time is of the essence and let's say your client can't wait the three months to get tested, then something like a radon bond can be agreed, which is basically a specified set or amount of cash which is set aside um, by both parties. It's usually around between 2,500 to 5,000 pounds to deal with the necessary works and remediation if anything is found. And now we're gonna move on to some of the screened risks that you get in the Enviro All-in-One. So the next three sections are screening, which means they provide you with some level of information, but if your client wants full details, then it will be recommended they purchase the corresponding recommended search. So for energy or the energy screen, we will look for oil and gas extraction wells, which does include fracking either existing or planned within five kilometers of the property. We will also look at any existing or planned wind and solar infrastructure um, and major energy, inst in energy installations. So that includes national grid power lines, gas lines, or any nationally significant energy projects. So things like Hinkley Point C or tidal lagoons or the Rampian wind farm, et cetera, et cetera. Then moving on to transportation. So for our transportation screen, we will let you know if we've identified any HS2 features within 2.5 kilometers of the property. So we look at both phase one and phase two of the project, and this includes routes, safeguarding areas, stations, or depots. We've also added um, new data into the H HS2 data set. So we, we now look at things like noise, uh, noise readings and uh, visual readings um, for HS2. 
We also provide information on Crossrail 1 and 2, so if there are any features within 250 meters of the property, then we will identify those. And with railways, again, features identified within 250 meters of the property of other rail infrastructure, including National Rail, uh, London Underground, um, any active railways and historic railway tunnels, we will identify those. We will tell you that we've identified some as well, but you will have to purchase a separate report. Uh, on top of that. And lastly, for the screening risks, we've got planning. So with our planning screen, we have what we call an intelligence screening process. This is where we take data from the Office of National Statistics, who categorize properties into three, which are rural, urban, and mega urban. And depending on the category the property uh, falls under, we then adjust screen the screening radius for small projects, large projects, and house extensions so that the, the screening results are the most relevant as possible. The last thing you want to do is have a search for planning applications, let's say in a busy city center at a large radius like 500 or 750 meters because it's just going to bring up hundreds of thousands of planning applications. And just like if you're out in a rural part of the country, you do want to cast a wider net because there is there's less around you and you want to to see what could potentially affect the property. So it's a smart way of applying location intelligence to provide more property specific information as possible. So in the planning screen screening, you will be provided with a total number of planning applications within the various distances, as well as um, you will get a full map um, if the property has been identified within a planning constraints area. So areas like a conservation area or green belt area or sites of special scientific interests um, where additional planning restrictions apply. But if your client wants the full detailed list of all the planning applications, they'll have to purchase a planning report in full. So what we're going to do now is look at some of the added value products that are offered um, if a particular hazard arises within the new Envirowall in one report. So looking now at the added value reports, we've put a, a bit of a quick uh, reference table together to illustrate um, if a risk is highlighted, what the associated products are. So firstly, if question four is highlighted, we would recommend either a mine entry interpretive report if there's an existing property footprint, or if not, you would need the mine entry plan and data sheets, which I'll go into more detail on the next slide, um, all of which can be purchased through our ordering platform, groundstability.com. If there are cases of any coal mining related substance, so question nine there on screen, there are three potential reports uh, we would recommend. So you've got your substance claims report, your substance buffer report, and a solicitor's claims history. Now, if any instances of mine gas has been flagged throughout the report, we would also um, have a mine gas emissions report. So that's question 10. And then if finally, if a surface hazard is recorded, you can request a surface hazard incident report. So what I'll, go, I'll do now is run through uh, the different reports in a bit more detail so you can have a look at what information will be supplied for each one. So starting with the two different mine entry reports, um, the mine entry interpretive report is only available if there's an existing building. So buildings located in the coal mining areas are subject to uh, any risk of coal mining subsidence or ground collapse. And this ground movement can be caused by problems uh, with entrances to coal mine known as, known as shafts or adits. Um, if a mine entry has been identified within 20 metres of a property boundary, this report can provide peace of mind to clients, um, insurers and lenders by assessing the risk of any mine entry. Um, and this is any damage that has maybe happened to an established property so that they ensure um, all of the remedies that have, been, that have taken place are available to them. It's also worth mentioning that there are thousands and thousands of recorded mine entries throughout the UK, and it's very rare that they pose a risk or create any issues. The report also sets out um, all of our statutory obligations here at the Coal Authority um, to repair any coal mining related substance. The main feature of the interpretive report is the detailed individual risk assessment for each mine entry within the boundary or within 20 metres of it. Um, you'll also get a OS map showing the mine entry positions. So um, 
If there's no existing building, so such as a, a land or development area, this is where the mine entry plan and data sheets will apply. So as per the interpretive report, the data sheets provides a table of information for each mine entry identified. Um, and within this report, you can pick and choose exactly which mine entries you would like the information supplying on. And this will also provide um, treatment details if held any confirmation of any mine entry source material and recorded dimensions of the mine entries in coordinates um, of any of the recorded locations. So moving now on to substance claims, if you have a claim outside the boundary but within 20 metres of it, this is where the substance 50 metre buffer can be purchased. So this report will give you the same details included in the Envirowall in one for the boundary specified uh, within a 20 metre area. These will then um, provide details um, in an easy to read table um, and will supply claim references and address details, what type of claim was it, uh, the date of the claim which we have received it here, the value of any repairs or compensation and finally a measurement of how far the claim is from the boundary. Um, the claims are also will also be lifted in order of uh, the distance from the property boundary. This report will only pick up claims outside the boundary but within 50 metres, but it will not detail any claims within the boundary drawn. Details of claims within the boundary drawn will be in the original um, Envirowall in one uh, or the subsequent search report. So to get the information on each claim in the original Envirowall in one, the boundaries must be exactly the same. So if you um, or your client wants more information on a specific claim, uh, we can provide a substance claims history report, which is a fully dependent, uh, sorry, which is fully dependent on the claim that was made. Um, when the report is ordered, a member of our team will collate um, all of the relevant information from our claims archive. And when supplied, the claims history will also include uh, all of the documentation followed by, with the claim, giving details of any history um, of what took place, so like when, where and why, uh, and this will then help potential property purchasers uh, remain fully informed. So if you purchase a mine gas emissions report listed in the overview of findings and recommendations, um, you'll get extensive details of any works carried out in relation to the mine gas emission. So, for example, stating whether a venting station has been built to manage any of the ongoing emissions, the locations of the site shown on the plan, um, complete with any pictures where appropriate, and you'll also get details around any various gases that have been recorded at the site, included copies of any graphs showing the monitored levels over a period of time. And the mine gas uh, report is also written by one of our in-house mine gas specialists, using the information that we have available for the site to provide real peace of mind to clients um, on the next steps that need to be taken to remedy the issue. So moving now to surface hazards, um, the Coal Authority handle around a thousand surface hazards um, each and every year. Um, these can vary from mine gas collapse, sorry, mine entry collapses or vandalism to mines, uh, shallow workings collapses and, and fissures in the ground caused by collapses in deeper workings. So when a surface hazard incident report is purchased, uh, you will receive information of um, a detailed report on the property in question and the boundary. You'll get copies of any available incident reports for that particular location, along with any inspection reports and copies of any uh, relevant correspondence, including like meeting notes. Information regarding any repairs that have, have undertaken at the site, and you'll also get details of any technical drawings from our in-house engineers. Um, and any information regarding any non-coal related damages that was flagged at the same time will be included. As with the claims history pack, these are totally bespoke uh, for each incident uh, where we've done works here um, at the Coal Authority for any given boundary. So if you ever need any additional information, um, it can be ordered through the system or please call through to a member of the team and we'll guide you through the process. Right, and from Ground Shore's perspective, if we have identified any planning impacts and your client, uh, clients would like to know 
uh, a lot more detail, then they are able to purchase a ground tour planning report. So this will provide a full list of planning applications for the following categories. You've got large projects, which include developments of 10 or more houses and or project, projects costing more than £250,000. You've got small projects, which include developments of three to nine houses and or projects costing less than £250,000. You've got house extensions or new builds for one to two properties. So as I mentioned previously, to ensure that the results are as relevant and useful as possible, we use the intelligent search radius um, application uh, which again will vary depending on whether the property is located in a rural urban or mega urban environment as mentioned previously we will provide a full list of the planning applications starting with the closest planning application to the property and working our way out to the furthest within the set radius and then you'll have the distance direction planning application details and status so whether or not it's been granted um, or not as well as when available, we provide an active link within the report uh, to the online planning information or application within the PDF. So if you click on the link, it'll take you to the website uh, where you can, your client can find more information on the actual planning application itself. You'll also get information on all the local infrastructure, amenities information, you've got schools and education information, crime rates, air quality data, and as I mentioned previously, you will be told whether or not the property is within a planning constraints area. And you know if it's within an area where there's a lot of listed buildings or it, it itself is a listed building, we will identify that as well. For the energy report, if your client would like to know more and they can purchase an energy report and we will search at a 5, 10 and 25 kilometer search radius for either existing or planned oil and gas wells or extraction areas, which do include fracking, any existing or planned wind and solar infrastructure. And we are looking at uh, small, you know, smaller wind turbines, so big farms, as well as, you know, maybe one or two uh, wind install you know turbine installations um, we'll also look at solar infrastructure any major energy installations and any nationally significant energy projects so again a full list will be will be provided along with maps um, starting from the closest to the furthest away with details of the scheme or the planning application if it's a proposed structure as well as who the operator is and we'll provide you information on who you should speak to to find out uh, more information in terms of the actual energy operator or builder. And then we've got a lot of rail infrastructure. So we do cover um, in, in various reports, HS2 and Crossrail 1, uh, HS2 and Energy Combined, um, and we even have a separate London Underground report depending on, again, whether or not your client's in London. So we will look in, in various search radiuses uh, to, to identify features for HS2 cross rail, including route, depth of tunnel, how it's going to affect the property, any construction zones, um, et cetera, et cetera. There is, there's quite a lot when it comes to rail infrastructure um, and a lot to cover depending on which part of the country. And of course, HS2 only affects certain parts of the country, same with cross rail one and two and same with underground. But, um, you know, it's becoming much more of a common request to find out all this information as it can potentially. And then moving on to um, the Cheshire Salt Search. So finally, for those who are in the Cheshire area, now the CON29M used to have questions relating to Cheshire brine within the report. Those are now no longer included uh, in the CON29M or the Enviro All-in-One, and it is now a standalone separate report called the Cheshire Salt Search, which has been commissioned by the Cheshire Brine Board. So it will answer the original questions that were included in the CON29, but also provide additional details and full maps and information on how the property is potentially impacted in the Cheshire area. So it will cover the compensation district, the consultation area, notice of damage, commuted claims, uh, any the presence of any wells or shafts, any historical salt mining, 
and whether or not it's within the GS7 planning policy, any active salt mining and information on future claims cover. So there is a very small area where coal and brine overlap. It's only about 18 square kilometers, but it is quite rare that um, one needs a salt search as well as a, a, a coal search. Um, they're not necessarily mutually inclusive, but if, if you need any further details, on any of the follow-on reports I've mentioned, please don't hesitate to either speak to Lisa or contact Groundshore directly. Thanks, Danny. Um, so both the Coal Authority and Groundshore are here um, to help um, any support or guidance that you may have, so please just give us a shout and we'll be more than happy to help. Um, in terms of the after service um, and to finish off, uh, this report will save you a vast amount of time um, as you're essentially getting all of the official CON 29M information together, along with the environmental information from Groundshore. Um, and this can either be purchased through your search provider or directly uh, from ourselves. And as I mentioned earlier, we are here to support you above and beyond the report. So whatever your needs may be, our experts are on hand. Um, if you would like any more information or would like to download, download a product card or view a sample of the report in detail, all of these are available on our de dedicated groundcivility.com website. So that concludes our webinar today. Um, I'd just like to apologize for any sound issues uh, that I think a few clients have, have had a few issues with. So my apologies for that, but this is a live webinar and we, we do um, have sound issues from time to time. I do hope you've all enjoyed listening and have found the content interesting. So please do keep your eyes peeled for further updates and webinars from the Coal Authority in the future. Um, and as I did mention at the start, there will be a short survey um, after the webinar is finished. And I'd really encourage you to pass us on your feedback um, about the delivery or anything you will, else you would like us to add into our webinars, um, as we really do value your feedback. We've also been gathering all of your questions throughout today's session. So we will look to um, fly some responses in the way of a handy FAQ document, uh, which we'll distribute uh, later on this month. And if you have any other questions or comments um, or would like to contact me directly, my contact details can be found on screen um, and we will be uploading a recording of the version of this webinar um, onto our YouTube channel. So uh, please keep your eyes peeled for that. So thank you very much and thank you to Danny uh, for joining us for our webinar program this month. And I'm wishing you all a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.